leaders in different religions bowing with them as they worship false gods. He said we all are children of God. Do you know that's not true? How many know we're not all children of God? Those that are children of God are those who are born again through the blood of Jesus. They are children of God. Jesus told those who called themselves sons of Abraham, He said, he said I could raise up uh, from these stones sons of Abraham. He said, the true sons of God are those who come through Jesus by faith. He said, you're of your father the devil. If you're not born again today, you are of your father the devil. You are not a child of God. So this, this when, when, I, when I saw this video, and I want to play the video sometime. It's about 30 minutes long. And that's why I didn't do it this morning because we've got so much going on. Uh, and the video, is there's a, uh, I can't remember his name. I couldn't pronounce it probably if I could. He's a Dutch minister. He speaks with a thick Dutch accent. And he shows how recent days Kenneth Copeland has invited a Catholic priest to come out and speak at his uh, church and welcoming them in and saying we should be together and unified. Okay, we can't. Some people don't understand and say, I can't believe you would be down on other religious. And, I, and believe me, this is not something I like to do. But i got to warn the church of what's going on. We have something, something coming down the pipe, and I want to show you something. And here's something that I was uh, reminded of when I watched this video that Jake sent me. was a message that I preached in 2004 at First Assembly of God in Lexington, North Carolina. I actually found the message and pulled it out. And it was great help. Even back then, God was already letting people know what was coming down the pipe. And uh, I was kind of astonished at the revelation that I had back then. This is before a lot of stuff that's going on, that's, that's happened, is going on right now. But uh, what I want to do to start off is let's read, turn to the book of Revelation. How many know it doesn't have an S on the end? It's not Revelations. It's revelation, the revelation. It's one revelation. It's not many revelations. It's, in fact, the word revelation, uh, the Greek word is apocalypse. And we understand the apocalypse to mean uh, great destruction. Really, it doesn't. Apocalypse means a revealing, an unveiling. So this is not revealings and unveilings. It is the revelation. It's not apocalypses. It's the apocalypse, okay? And actually, the word apocalypse comes from the fact, from actually from the Scripture is where we get our meaning because the revelation shows great destruction. And that's where we get the term uh, destruction from when we think about apocalypse, although the actual word doesn't mean that. Okay, chapter 17, Revelation chapter 17. And I'm going to read the whole chapter. And I'm going to try to get through this quick. Because I know i got 30 minutes till lunchtime. And I don't want to lose people. Hallelujah. I'm going to try to get through this quick. And uh, this is only going to be one installment. We're going, to, we're going to go on and talk about this a little bit more next week. And I don't know if we'll get farther than that or not. We'll just see. But Revelation chapter 17 verse 1. It says, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials. And talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So, she carried, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, note scarlet, full of names of blasphemies, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Note that again. And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, 
full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Where didst thou, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, and which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not. And it shall send out the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Is your name there? Is your name written there? There's an old song that says, I know, I know, my name is written there. It says here, but those whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, they behold the beast that was and is and not, and yet is. And here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. It's a lot of words, ain't it? And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as of yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind. And shall give their power and strength unto the beast. They shall make war with the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Jesus. And the Lamb shall overcome them, for He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Hallelujah. That's you, folks. And He saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Wow, there's so much symbolism, so much, and there's no way I could teach on this chapter. There's so much in it. So I'm going to hit some highlights for you. We first, we find out that there's a woman, a whore, and we know what a whore is. And I'm not cussing. I'm speaking right out of the book of, here, right out of the Word of God. A whore. We know what a whore is. A whore is a prostitute, someone who has illicit sexual relationships with people she's not married to, who commits fornication. Okay, this whore, it says, is sitting upon many waters. Well, what is that talking about? Well, verse 15 interprets it for us. It says that the many waters are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. That's, the, that's what she sits on, okay? Sitting, in verse 3, it says she sits on it. She sits on the beast. Sitting in the scripture is symbolic of a place of authority. A place of authority. Numerous times in the scripture it's mentioned that Jesus Christ, after he arose from the dead, ascended into heaven. And where is he at right now? He's doing what though? He's sitting at the right hand of God. He is in a place of authority. So sitting shows a place of authority. So this woman has authority over the beast that she's sitting on, the peoples, the waters that she's on. She has authority over these things. So it says she's arrayed in purple and scarlet, as well as the beast she's being carried by is scarlet. Scarlet is a color that is synonymous with immorality and sin, particularly prostitution or adultery. Red, scarlet. Roxanne, 
you don't have to put out the red light. I hate to have to use that for an illustration, but I think it touches everybody knows. Red. How many know a, a red light? I mean, that's a prank you play on people. You slip up at night and take their porch light out and put a red one in. Yeah. Some of y'all get that later. But, uh, but a red light means, you've heard of the red light district in Amsterdam? Red light, red, prostitution, adultery, fornication, immorality. So she is clothed in immorality. And she's riding a beast that is clothed that is immoral. And that is a, a prostitute or a harlot. Why is she a prostitute? Why is she a harlot? Because she's not faithful to her husband. The church is married to who? Jesus. So this is symbolic of a church that is not faithful to her first love. Jesus. Okay? She's a harlot. She's a whore. She has a name. First of all, it says her name is a mystery. Her name is also Babylon the Great. We know what Babylon is. Babylon was a, a kingdom that ruled the world. Actually, the greatest kingdom that ruled the world in the sense of uh, uh, control and majesty. It was, it was under a king named Nebuchadnezzar. Talks about him in the book of Daniel. Remember Daniel in the lion's den? Remember the three Hebrew children that were thrown in a fiery furnace? Yeah, this is Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. These are, these are uh, under their reigns in Babylon. Babylon is symbolic of a world system. It's symbolic of a governmental system that is not of God. Our world system today is a system of Babylon. And I, I don't know how to address it right now, but uh, 501c3, anybody ever heard of that? Churches are 501c3. Why are we 501c3? Do you know taxes aren't, churches aren't taxed anyway under the Constitution? Did you know that there is no need for a church to have a 501c3 rating? Because the Constitution... Uh, What's the word I want? Makes us immune to taxes. Ta churches are not taxed anyway. But see, we've bought onto the bandwagon under the Johnson Amendment also. But see, our current president, he's revoked that Johnson Amendment. And he's doing away with this stuff. So that we don't have to be under this Babylonian system. So that's why I'm caught in the middle there. Uh, if depending on which way things turn, I will look to removing us from the 501c3 because we don't have to be under that. We are we are guaranteed. Um, I can't can't remember the, the word. I, exemption. That sounds really good. Exemption from taxes by the Constitution. We certainly are, but nevertheless, this mastery Babylon. Babylon the Great is symbolic of a world system. It says that she's the mother of harlots, in verse 5, and abominations. How many ever knows when a great big storm like a hurricane will come on the coast, you might hear the weatherman say, it's the mother of all storms. Right? Why? Because it's big. She's the mother of all of it. And she's not only the mother of it in a sense of, of, of largeness and degree, but she's also the mother of abominations in the maternal sense. Because this system gives birth to wickedness. Did you know that? Did you know our system's wicked? The only thing good about our system is the fact that they follow a Judeo-Christian law that was, that was set forth by the Bible. That's the only thing that makes our system even close to being righteous. Is because they punish the evildoers and reward those that don't. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an evil system. It's a Babylonian system. The beast that carries her 
that has seven heads and ten horns, the scarlet beast, he is representative of the world government or a political Babylon which supports this religious system. This religious system, this whore, this left her first love, this church is riding upon the beast that has seven heads and ten horns, which is symbolic of a world system. And it supports the lady. Okay, we'll figure out a little bit more about that. It supports this religious, this false religious system. So my question for you is who is this great whore that the Bible talks about? Does she have a name that we know? Is this person that is identified in prophecy right here, is it somebody we could recognize today in this world? I'm going to give you some ideas today. This is a post-rapture scene, chapter 17. This is about three and a half years into the tribulation period. How long does the tribulation last? Seven years. So this is halfway through it. How many know that the first three and a half years of the tribulation period is not supposed to be really, really bad? In fact, it may be good in some places. But how many know the second half of the tribulation period is when the good stuff starts happening? That's when the plagues start coming in. The vials are poured out. The wrath of God is unleashed on this earth like no man has ever known or will ever know again after it's over. That's when this is starting to take place. This is halfway through the tribulation period. So I have a question for you. If the church is raptured before the tribulation, what is it doing here in the middle? What is it doing here three and a half years into the tribulation period if the church is supposed to be raptured before the tribulation takes place? Well, Tommy, are you going to preach mid-trib to us? No. Are you going to preach post-trib to us? No. I preach pre-trib. I believe that we're not appointed to wrath but to obtain salvation through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I believe He's coming back to get us at the trumpet sound. Hallelujah. At the last trump. The dead in Christ are going to rise, and we which are alive and remain are going to be called together in the air to meet Him in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Yes, I believe that's going to happen. So why is the church here in the middle of the tribulation period? It's pretty simple. This church didn't go in the rapture. Okay? The rapture has taken place already at this point, and this church did not go in the rapture. Did you know that's going to happen? Did you know there are going to be people who go to church who are not going to go into rapture? Because their hearts are not right. Because they left their first love. And they, and they went whoring after something else. That's what he says. He, I don't care, you could be a man whore. You don't have to be a woman. You could be a man whore. That's right. What that means is, is that you've got affections for somebody else. Or something else. And what could that something else be? It could be anything. Yeah. It could be, it could be uh, your job. It could be making money. It could be pleasure. It could be things that we put ahead of Jesus Christ. We're going a whoring after those things. And we're considered prostitutes. God's calling the church to a place of repentance. Hallelujah. Where he is the only one. He is the bridegroom. And I am his bride. And I might, oh, hallelujah. The bride and the bridegroom. What a, what a special thing. You know, there's nothing more beautiful than a bride on wedding day. All of her hopes and dreams. You ever, you ever look? Adam, when they're standing there and they're looking at each other and they're getting ready to put their rings on, the look on their faces, the love, the devotion for each other, nobody could mess with it. Nobody could get in between it. Nobody could get in the way. That bride, her look is to that husband, who's, or to that man who's going to be her husband soon. And all her hopes are in him and her future is in him. That's what God wants out of us. We're to look at our bride, I mean our bridegroom, which is Jesus, and we're to have all of our hope in Him. And nothing should come in the way. You see, I was a groom the first time I got married. But I'm going to be the bride the next time. Amen? The bride of Christ. Hallelujah. 
Who is this church? It's a church that didn't make it because doctrinally they followed doctrines of devils and they went to whoring after things that were not of God. That's why they didn't make the rapture, okay? Who is this church? Who are these people? Are they just made up of people from every denomination? Sure. Sure, there's going to be people from every denomination in the whole world that don't make the rapture. One, because they never got born again. Or two, because they turned their back on their first love and backslid and refused to repent. Yes, you will miss out if you refuse to repent. Keep your sin on short account, people. Keep it on short account. If you sin, confess it, get over it, and get back in the game. Amen? Get back in the game. Amen. Well, I submit to you today that this church is a Catholic church. Now, it's going to be a blend, and we'll talk about that next week, between this, uh, the Jews, and Islam in the end. That's exactly who this is. But the Catholic church is the method or the doorway that Satan is going to use, and it has been using for many years, to take us in or take the church into the tribulation period because they're not going in the rapture. You know what the word, does anybody know what the word Catholic means? Universal. Catholic means universal. The video we watched today talked about a universal church, didn't it? It talked about everybody worshiping the same God, whether you call him Allah, whether he's a Buddha, Hare Krishna, whatever. He's the same God. No, he is not. He is Jehovah God. He is God of the Bible. He is the great I Am. And he bows to no other God, neither will he share his glory with any other. Hallelujah. He is God. Can we fellowship with other faiths? That's funny. I can fellowship with, with these people about like I can fellowship with the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons. As people, sure, got to love them. I don't hate them. In fact, I feel sorry for these poor people who are deceived and caught up in these things. But let me, let me open up some stuff for the Catholic Church for you here that's going to uh, rock your world a little bit. You see, this church didn't go in a rapture. And this church was acceptable by Satan and the Antichrist for a certain time. Do you know that the, the Satan does not care who you worship as long as you don't worship God? He doesn't care who you worship as long as you don't worship God. Because his, his, the whole goal and his whole plan is to keep you away from God. He's content with that now. Right now he's content with that. See, this church was acceptable to Satan for a time. But there's going to come a time when he's tired of it. There's going to come a time when Satan's going to want all worship for himself. He's not going to want to share it with nobody. Because he wants to be God. Did you know that? Did you know Satan wants to be God? Yeah, Ezekiel and Isaiah both tell us about how, well, talks about getting thrown out of heaven. Talks about how he said, I will ascend into the, to the hill of the Most High. I will be like the Most High. I will be God. God showed him who he was, didn't he? He throwed him out. But he wants to be God. He wants people to worship him. Where do you think Satan worshipers come from? He loves that. But there's going to come a time when he's going to get tired of sharing his worship with this, uh, well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. I'm just going to go on. Hold on. But why? did he put up with this for all these years? The Catholic Church has been around for many years. It's been around since the probably the inception of it was around 300 A.D., something like that. That's a long time. Why has he put up with it all those years? Verse 6, what's it say? And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints and with the blood of martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. 
because she was drunken with the blood of the saints of God and martyrs of Jesus Christ. Because she killed the saints of God and martyred those in the name of Jesus. She martyred them. She killed them. That's why he tolerated her. Because she has murdered and martyred the saints of God and kept people away from the true worship of God and the way to salvation for all these years. She's, do, he's, she's doing his bidding. Well, how could you say that, Brother Tommy? I'll show you how I could say it. A reign of terror by the Catholic Church lasted for about 1,260 years. And it was prophesied in Daniel 7, Daniel 7 and Revelation 13. And what happened was the people that refused to bow to the authority of the Catholic Church would be killed. Did you know that? It don't happen right now, but in ages past it happened. If you refused to bow to the authority of the church, you would be killed. Remember I said the lady sit, she had a place of authority over the people. How many know that the Vatican is actually considered a nation? Uh-huh. It is. And how many know all, all your nations in Europe and a big part of the United States are Catholic, Roman Catholic? And their money goes into Catholicism. It's supported by the people, by the nations, by the beast. Hallelujah. Right now, in the Catholic Church, there's a statue of a man named Ignatius Loyola. Ignatius Loyola. He is the founder of the Jesuit order. Does anybody know what the Jesuits are? Yeah, they're a special priesthood. Yeah, J James is an authority. Y'all want to talk about it? Y'all can see him after church. He'll lay it, he'll lay it on you. The Jesuits is a, is a secret order in the Catholic Church. They're like almost like a secret service. And they're responsible for a lot of bad, bad things that go on. But this Ignatius Loyola was the founder of the Jesuit order. And in the Vatican, until this very day, there is a statue of him. Okay? In this statue, he is holding the Jesuit Constitution while trampling under his foot a Christian holding a Bible. It's in the Vatican right now. Now, what's up with that? What is up with that? Uh-huh. See, it's a statue in honor of what the Roman Catholic Church did to all those faithful, Bible-believing Christians in time past. And that evil spirit still resides in the Catholic Church. Sure, there's a lot of good people there. But we're talking about what's behind the scenes. And we're talking about what this man who runs the thing knows about. And what, he's, what his real goal is. And where Satan is at in this situation. Then there's the translator martyrs. Anybody ever heard of John Wycliffe? Wycliffe Bible Translators, John Wycliffe, he lived in the 1400s. Uh, Pope Martin in 1427, see what happened was John Wycliffe translated the Bible into English and gave it to the people. That was a no-no. Because the common man, according to the Catholic Church, should not have the Word of God because they cannot properly interpret it. In other words, we keep the Word of God. We'll interpret it for you, and we'll tell you what it means. Well, that's good, ain't it? That's real good. We can tell you what we want to tell you. That's why they got all these extra biblical writings in their Bible, in their, in their Scripture. The Apocrypha. These other inspired books that's not even there. And that's where they get these doctrines from that are not biblical doctrines. Okay? John Wycliffe translated to give to the people. They put him on trial. They put him on trial, put him in jail. 
Okay, John Wycliffe died, but in 1427, Pope Martin ordered his bones to be exhumed from the grave and burned and cast into the River Swift, 40 years after he had been dead. His offense still inflamed and irritated the Catholic Church that bad because of what he did. They dug his bones up, burned them, and cast them into the sea. Because of why? What did he do? What was his sin? He translated the Word of God and gave it to the common man. John Huss, in 1416, he done the same thing. He translated the Word of God and gave it to people. They burned him at the stake. Who did? The Catholic Church. And why did they burn him? Because he translated the Word of God and gave it to the common man, just like I have today. Okay? We, have you ever heard of William Tyndale? Yeah, William Tyndale. Guess what his crime was? He translated the Word of God into English and gave it to the common man. Get what they do to him in 1536? They burned him at the stake. What kind of church, what kind of church kills people who give the Word of God to man, to common man? Something's wrong, y'all. Something's wrong here. Next week we're going to dig deeper in this as we'll have a little more time. But verse 6 says that she was drunken with the blood of the saints and the martyrs. How, how many millions of people they had put to death to keep them from giving the word of God to the common man so that he could understand the way of salvation. You know there are 1.2 billion Catholics in the world? The world population is only 7.6 billion. If I was good at math, I'd tell you what the percentage was there, but I ain't got a clue. 1.6 billion Muslims. 900 million Protestants. That's who we are. Does anybody know what the word Protestant means? What's the root word? Protest. That's what it means. Protestant is someone who protests. So that's why the Protestant church come about. They protested. How many ever heard of Martin Luther? I'm not talking about the one who's uh, the main street's named after. In, in every city. Not that Martin Luther. I'm talking about Martin Luther, the German guy. Yeah, in the 1500s, who nailed his was it 98 thesis to the church of the Catholic, to the door of the Catholic church, saying, I see what's going on. I understand what's going on and how you're misleading the people. And broke away. And between him, Zwingli, and Sweden, and a man named John Calvin, the Protestant Reformation happened. They protested against the wickedness that was in the Catholic Church. And that's why we exist today. We are branches from that. In fact, the largest number of Protestants are Pentecostals and Charismatics. Did you know that? Of whom we are. 900 million of us. Quite a bit less than the Muslims and the Catholics. But Catholicism is responsible, and I'm going to name a few things over the years, been responsible for. Do you know Catholicism was responsible for the Dark Ages? How many remember reading about the Dark Ages in, in school? Wow, two of you. Goodness me. Where were y'all? Y'all must have been sleeping in history class, is all I got to say. Well, I'm going to give you a history lesson. There was a time in history called the Dark Ages. Things were really bad. You know why it was dark? Because the Catholic Church had hidden the Word of God, would not let man have it, had locked it up, and things got so bad and so wicked because of their control over society. Because, see, they were made the state church. Yeah, they were made the state church. And because of their control, the, the flame of the gospel almost just flickered. It almost went out until the Reformation, until men like Calvin... And Luther stood up and said, this is wrong. And that's when things started to happen. That's when our world changed, is when we come at it. The Catholic Church put the world in the dark ages. The Jesuit priesthood. 
Can say we could get into that. Maybe next week we can talk about a little bit more. They're responsible for that. They're responsible for the worship of Mary. Y'all hear me? See, Kenneth Copeland was inviting this uh, priest in because you know what the priest is saying? He's saying to the Catholics, we got a new stance. We believe that salvation is by grace through faith alone and not of works. And works comes out of that. And everybody said, hallelujah, y'all finally saw the light. You know, but what about all the other stuff? What about worshiping Mary? Everybody ever heard the term immaculate conception? You know what that means? That means in order for Mary to have had Jesus, the Son of God, she had to be perfect. Mm-hmm. That was what it meant. In other words, she herself had to practically be a God. She was not. She was a chaste virgin, chosen of God to bear the Messiah, but she was a woman. And you know what? She died one day. And you know what? She went to heaven. And you know what? We can't pray to her. You know what? The Bible forbids us praying to anybody but God. The Bible forbids us to call any man father but God. Wow. That's touching on another place, ain't it? The worship of Mary. The sacraments of the church. They don't believe that you're saved by faith through grace. They believe you're saved by keeping the sacraments of the church. There's seven sacraments of the church that they have. Communion's one of them. Baptism's one of them. We celebrate those things, but not as sacraments of the church. We don't consider them sacraments. But they believe you're saved by keeping these things. Confessing your sins to a priest. Guess what? I don't have to confess my sins to a priest because I have the high priest, Jesus Christ, who is the only intercessor between God and man that I intercedes for me that I confess my sins to. Sure, we are to confess our sins to one another, the Bible says, that we might be healed. But I don't need to go to no booth and sit down with some guy and quote my sins to him and ask him to forgive me or ask him to go to God for me and forgive me, okay? So we've got the dark ages. We've got the J-suit priesthood, the worship of Mary, the sacraments of the church, the prayer to dead saints. Do you know they pray to dead people? They pray to St. Peter or the patron saints. Do you know what the definition of saint is? Someone who's born again. Every one of you are saints. St. Peter is no greater than you. He's no greater than St. Gladys. How about that? They're all the same in God's eyes. Teaching on purgatory. You know the scripture does not tell us that there's any place between heaven and hell. That when you die, you go immediately to one or the other. When you die, you go to be with Jesus. If you're saved, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, right? If you are lost, you go to a place called hell where there's no chance of coming out. Purgatory is a place between heaven and hell, according to the Catholic Church. And if I pay the priest enough money, he'll pray my loved one out of purgatory and pray him into heaven. How do you like it? Okay. And then the priesthood in general. We're the priesthood. The Bible says that we are kings and priests unto God. Every believer is a priesthood. There's no need for a priesthood. There's no need for somebody to stand in the gap between you and God. And the last one is considering the Pope as God. Did you know that? He can absolve you from your sins. His words are the words of God. Uh huh. He's just a man like me. He puts his britches on one leg at a time, which I think he wears in robes. But nevertheless, he's still a man, right? He's just a man. 
want to read something from 1 John 4, 3 to you. 1 John 4, 3 says, And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, wherever you have heard that it should come. All right? And even now already is it in the world. John, writing this book around, I don't know, 80 to 90 A.D., said that the Antichrist spirit was already in the world. We know there's a man that's going to come identified in the book of Revelation as the Antichrist, right? The Jews are going to accept him as the Christ. He's actually uh, possessed by the spirit of Satan. He's Satan incarnate, basically. But he said there are many Antichrists already in the world, okay? This beast that we're seeing says it had seven horns, right? Seven heads, um, excuse me, not seven, it was ten horns. Seven heads, which are representative of seven mountains. Actually, this is representative of seven kings who had the Antichrist spirit that lived since the beginning of time. And those kings are identified through the scripture. The first one will be Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. The second will be Darius, who was also king of Babylon. The third one will be Alexander the Great. Anybody ever heard of him? Yeah, the king of the uh, Grecio Persian Empire. The second one will be Antiochus Epiphanes, who lived or reigned between 175 and 164 BC. And the things he did were so, were almost so exact to what the Antichrist will do in the book of Revelation. There are actually sects of churches who believe that Revelation was fulfilled when he was alive. And it is not as yet that it, we think it's yet to be fulfilled. They say it's already fulfilled because he fulfilled it. That's how close to the Antichrist he was. These people are types of the Antichrist. The sixth one, I mean the fifth one, was a man named Nero. Ever heard of him? A wicked, wicked. He's the one that had the Apostle Paul killed, had him beheaded, along with many Christians, fed him to the lions. That's what they done for entertainment. They didn't go watch football games. They went down to the stadium and watched the Lions eat Christians. I don't know if they sold popcorn or not. But nevertheless, you know, it don't sound like my kind of thing. The Scripture tells us in verse 11 that... Uh, no, verse 10. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, one of them is, and the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. The one is is Domitian, because this was written during his reign. So the, the Antichrist figure that was alive at the time of the writing of the book of Revelation was Domitian. The one to come was number seven, Adolf Hitler. How many know Adolf Hitler hated the Jews? Hmm, didn't he? He was a type of the Antichrist. But he wasn't the Antichrist. He was the one who would come. And the last one will actually be the Antichrist, who is the eighth. I was trying to explain some of this language here to you. Verses 15 and 16 teach us. It says, And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. The ten horns, the Bible says, are ten kings which have not come into power yet, but they will come into power at this time. And these ten kings will hate the whore because they'll be inspired by the beast. They'll be inspired by Satan who is done with the whore, who is done with the church. He's used the Catholic church and, and these other religions that are going to amalgamate into it. He's used them to accomplish his purpose on the earth. The rapture is taking place and the tribulation is started. He don't need her no more and he don't want her around no more. He don't want any semblance of Jesus. Even though she represents him in a twisted way, he don't want that around anymore and he destroys her. It says here that he burns her with fire. He burns her with fire. The Antichrist and his followers will hate her and they will destroy her. This church, 
The Antichrist will not tolerate the semblance of God and will destroy all that worship so that he can have the worship for himself. There's so much more with this guy. There's, guys, there's so much more of a description of the Catholic Church in these pages that we can look at next week. And also how Islam is going to figure into the end time prophecy. And how this video that we watched this morning was monumental because it showed us that our world is headed to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. And the Pope's leading the charge. He's wanting to pull this thing together. So don't be deceived into believing that we are all children of God. Don't be deceived into believing that just because the building has church wrote on it means that they worship the true God. Hallelujah. Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you and praise you. And I glorify your name.